ministr Haváček se koordinátorem kolegie Evropea při Filozofické fakulty Univerzity Karlovy a Filozofické ústavu Akademie věd a jemu milou povinností vás zde na místě Filozofické fakulty přivítat i jménem Polského institutu v Praze. Nebo to se vlastně teďko nenahrává. Protože se to nahrává pro záznam na, na YouTube. To funguje? Ne. Technika vždycky trochu zrazuje. Já se budu mít čas ještě dorazit, když se dělá pozdělci. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Tak ještě jednou milí přátelé, teď už na mikrofon, moje jméno je Havláče, vítám vás jménem kolegy Evropea při Filozofické fakultě Univerzity Karlovy a Filozofickém ústavu Akademie věd a to společně s Polským institutem tady v Praze a to na přednášce polského kolegy, historika, profesora Andřeje Novaka. Vítejte, pane profesore. Dobrý večer. Kolegu bych rád se představil. Andřej Novak je Krakoviak, tedy rodák z Krakova, uh-huh. historik a publicista, profesor humanitních věd na Krakovské Jagronské univerzitě, mimo jiné také člen kolegia Ústavu národní paměti ve Varšavě a rytíř řádu Bílého Orla. Zabývá se dějinami Polska, východní Evropy a Ruska, zejména problematikou ruského imperialismu. Je autorem například velkých děj Polska a dalších knih namátkou Poláci Rusové běsy, nebo od impéria k impériu, dějiny politických tradic, Polsko a tři Ruska nebo také metamorfózy Ruského impéria. Některé ho studie vyšly i knižně, česky, například pod názvem Imperium a ti druzí. Jeho dnešní přednáška se jmenuje Ruské imperiální tradice a současná agrese, čili, a to je otázka, kdo je nepřítel, tedy pro Rusko, Ukrajina, Evropa nebo Západ. Tady ještě se musíme domluvit, kolega ohlásil, že přednáška bude anglicky, ale mohla by být i polsky, záleží na tom, co byste preferovali. Tak nevím, jak se hlásíte třeba k polštině, jestli by to byla spíš preference, ale zase nechceme znásilňovat ty, kteří polsky nehovoří, tak nevím, jestli mám dát hlasovat. Kdo by byl pro polštinu? A kdo by byl spíš pro angličtinu? Takže zůstaneme u angličtiny. Takže, šanovní paní profesoře, vítám vás tutaj v Praze na Vyhrále filozofické univerzitetu Karola. Je to dla nás bardzo velký honor, včetně v těch časech, kdy bezprostředně se budeme přejavit rasistického imperialismu, agresivní vojně Rosy, většinou odvážně v Ukrajině. Proše, paní profesoře, a pan Dolos, Mos. Děkuji bardzo. Možná to. Dobry wieczór. I would like to apologize. I uh, unfortunately do not speak uh, Czech language. I understand uh, most of it, but so you can ask questions in in Czech language. Uh, I can answer in Polish or in English uh, as you wish. Uh, But as it was said, uh, I will uh, present my uh, approximately one hour uh, lecture uh, in English. Uh, I hope it will be easier to follow it uh, due to uh, a few pictures I want to illustrate my, uh, my lecture with. So the question is whether it is only about Ukraine, uh, whether uh, uh, consecrating Ukraine would be uh, enough for Russia to stop because this type of reasoning is quite popular, unfortunately, I would say, both among so-called realists in the United States, uh, narrow but influential circle of political analysts, but also uh, among uh, broader public, uh, not just in the States, but uh, also in Western Europe especially, but even in our region, uh, I mean, is Central or Central Europe, there are people who uh, think this is not our problem. Uh, This is only about Russian backyard. Russians want to have what 
more or less naturally belong to them. Just like any empire wants to have uh, peace in uh, its own backyard. So my intention is to present that question, whether it is only about Ukraine, uh, in a broader historical context. As a historian, I tend to look uh, at things historically. And uh, believe me, and I will try to persuade you, that history is extremely important, not just for me, but also for many Russians, and especially for Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin who uh, presented quite recently a series of very long texts uh, underwritten by him, uh, so he presents himself as author, uh, the author of these texts, that deal with very specific, very detailed, minute questions of history. Uh, some of them uh, serve, obviously, to justify Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, some of them are consecrated to uh, broader texts. Uh, so history is something important to understand, uh, uh, not only some old questions, but also to understand the way of thinking, of reasoning uh, of those people who organized Russian imperial aggression and back this aggression, I mean millions of ordinary Russians. So when you look at this map, the map shows uh, the place of Russian Empire on the globe uh, some 155 years ago with Alaska, Finland, uh, uh, most, most of Poland belonging to, uh, uh, to Russian Empire. But as you know, most of these territories still form Russian imperial core and this green spot on the map is something uh, printed, so to speak, very deeply in Russian uh, political identity. Uh, the discourse in which uh, Russian people uh, say, we have to retake what we lost. Uh, we have to retake not just Ukraine, but also uh, of course, uh, Baltic uh, countries also, uh, even Finland, uh, even Poland, but more so uh, to retake Alaska is something not uh, that rare. Uh, if we want to start with Ukraine, we should start, actually, everyone uh, treating uh, the subject of Russian aggression against Ukraine should start from the most extensive uh, text published by Vladimir Putin just on July uh, 2021, uh, where he presented uh, in this text on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. This is the title of the text. Uh, historical reasons why Ukraine should be reunited, as he says, to, uh, uh, to Russia. And I do not want to stop on these reasons he mentions, though we will go back to them. But I want to start from the uh, core reasoning in that text, namely that whoever speaks about separation, this is the term of uh, Putin, of Ukraine from Russia, operates as agent of evil forces of the West. And with that, we go straight to something much broader than Ukraine. There are evil forces in the West that try to diminish, to destroy Russia. The evil forces of the West are the enemy, not Ukraine. Ukraine is presented rather as a helpless victim, not of Russia, of course, Ru Russia liberates Ukraine, but as a helpless victim of these evil forces of the West. Among these evil forces are Poland, Austro-Hungarian, or rather Austrian Empire, 19th century influences. And now it is first and foremost uh, uh, the Atlantic Alliance uh, America in the first place. Uh, but uh, if we uh, go deeper in the text, we find the key element uh, in uh, symbolism of that conflict, element linking that symbolism personally to Vladimir Putin. This is Vladimir, namesake of the president of Russian Federation. Vladimir the Great, the founder of, uh, I will uh, 
show his monument. Uh, no, I don't have it here, sorry. So uh, I will just say about it. Uh, the monument that was raised by uh, Putin in Moscow in uh, 2016 and was unveiled on uh, uh, November 4th uh, that year at a very symbolic day, namely the holiday established by Vladimir Putin for his subjects, for citizens of Russia. Holiday uh, remembering uh, four centuries old history of repelling Polish occupants from the Kremlin because in 1612, after two years, Polish, uh, so to speak, occupants from the Kremlin were uh, forced to capitulate and Russia, so to speak, regained uh, sovereignty. And that particular moment of losing that sovereignty over the Kremlin, the heart of Russia, is remembered as the national holiday number one in Russia uh, since Putin's days. And exactly on that day, Putin unveiled a huge monument to Vladimir the Great, uh, the Grand Duke of Kievian Rus, who already had this, uh, still has this uh, monument in Kiev, the place where he actually ruled. Because Putin wants to say Kievian Rus is simply part of our Russian history. We are the center of that history. Vladimir belonged to us, not to Russia. But there is something more than this observation, which usually concentrates most of the attention of, so to speak, analysts of that speech or rather of that text of Putin. Putin uh, refers to Vladimir as the source of moral code uniting Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusian, Eastern Orthodox people, because Vladimir was the Grand Duke who baptized himself and baptized his surrounding uh, people, that is uh, original, so to speak, Kievian Rus elite, in Eastern Orthodox, uh, uh, so to speak, variation of Christianity from Byzantium. And this is exactly what makes something like a link to the very essence of Russian imperial messianic idea, still reverberating very effectively in Putin's, uh, in Putin's uh, concepts. Here, something may be unusual uh, for you. Uh, any guesses what building uh, could it be and where it is? Well, this is the oldest city in the world, Jericho, in Palestine, 14,000 years old. And this is the largest building in Jericho. And it belongs to Russian president. Uh, this is uh, one of the palaces of uh, Russian president. And it is run by Russian Imperial Palestine Society, established exactly in the middle of 19th century and emanating from that moment, from mid 19th century, the idea that Palestine, Holy Land, should belong to Russia. By the way, in Jericho, which is relatively not such a small city, about 40,000 people inhabits that city, the main street is called uh, Dmitry Medvedev Street. This is the name of the main street in, in the oldest uh, town in, in the world. Uh, so this suggests simply that the center, the symbolic center of Christianity, more so of three universal religions, Christianity, Islamism, and Judaism, should belong to us, to Russia. We will never resign from it. This is what this particular building symbolizes. Uh, the next picture, which somehow illustrates uh, these ambitions, is simply um, imperial emblem, official imperial emblem of Russia, which, as you can maybe recognize on its uh, right wing has Polish eagle, Poland, as uh, an element belonging to, to Russia. Uh, here you can see a lion symbolizing Finland belonging to Russia. And there is small part, uh, uh, Archangel Michael, uh, who symbolizes uh, Ukraine, for example, and many, many other countries that belong rightly to Russian imperial eagle, double-headed eagle stemming from 
um, from Byzantine tradition. And uh, that particular Byzantine tradition is something very important, sometimes uh, overlooked when uh, people are analyzing contemporary Russian uh, imperial idea. It is still influential, especially due to that concept. Maybe I will make it bigger. Uh, the concept of Moscow the Third Rome. The famous concept uh, that uh, was uh, for the first time expressed in the beginning of 16th century under Tsar uh, uh, Ivan III and, uh, and his son Vasily III. Uh, this idea uh, presented for the first time in such a mature way a combination of imperial and messianic ideas concentrating on Russian expansion, uh, political or geopolitical goals. It was formulated after Byzantium, the Byzantine Empire fell to the Turkish Empire in mid uh, 15th century. And Russia, being the only Eastern Orthodox power at that moment in the world, uh, felt himself, or rather Muscovy, because this was the official name of what we call uh, sometimes not very accurately Russia in 16th century. So uh, Muscovy was the only sovereign center of Eastern Orthodoxy at that moment. And Eastern Orthodox people differentiating themselves and being differentiated uh, from Latin world, from Western Christianity, uh, from the very beginning of baptism of Russia, that is from 10th century, uh, so to speak, uh, developed a strong, uh, I would say, uh, identity of anti-Western attitude. We represent, we Eastern Orthodox represent the only true religion. They, that is the West, Latin West, Catholic West at that time, represents something not only false, but also aggressive that uh, takes land from Eastern Orthodox people. That's why the uh, fall of Byzantium was uh, treated as a kind of justified, justified <coughs> uh, sorry, uh, fall uh, resulting from union that Byzantine Empire uh, decided to make with papacy in Florence. Betrayal of Eastern Orthodoxy was castigated by God through the fall of Byzantium. Russia, Moscovy was the only country that stayed faithful to this hatred towards the West, to that Eastern Orthodox idea. And that's why Russia now represents the, the task of regaining the whole world under the scepter of the only true religion, that is Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, and here, if you uh, look at this contemporary icon, not from 16th century, but from the uh, 21st century, you can see the enemies on both sides of the center of the Holy Russia. On one side, you have papacy, rather representing traditions of anti-Latinism uh, from the original Moscow the Third from idea. But here is contemporary incarnation of the evil, America, the United States. Uh, and below many other uh, particular illustrations of historical fights between Russia and Western enemies. Here you can see another important element of Russian imperial, I would say, anti-Western tradition that is continued and revived under Putin. The monument to uh, Prince Pozharsky sitting, sitting and uh, Kuzma Minin. Uh, these two men led the national popular revolt against Polish occupants of the Kremlin in 1612. They led this victorious revolt. So they represent something like a victorious rising of Russian people against the West that occupies the heart of Russia. The monument 
Uh, as uh, you can guess, maybe some of you uh, uh, saw this monument uh, in Moscow or, or some pictures from Moscow, stays exactly at the gates of the Kremlin before uh, the uh, church uh, of uh, Vasily Błażenny. Uh, and it was uh, raised, it was unveiled right after the second occasion when these memories from early 17th century revived quite naturally, one can say, after 1812, after Napoleon invasion of Russia. So just a few years later, this monument was raised to remind Russians, the West is ready to occupy us. The West wants to eliminate us. We have to remember our unity in this rebellion against the West. Uh, there is no time uh, for, uh, so to speak, more detailed uh, descriptions of those fight with the West. Here is one more uh, important element of this imagery that is deeply instilled in Russian historical and cultural traditions. This is the picture portraying uh, decisive uh, geopolitical change in Eastern Europe, the moment when Russian forces under Peter, uh, Peter I, beaten uh, Swedish king Charles XII, accompanied by Ivan Mazepa, Ukrainian hetman that led Ukrainians against Russian imperialism. And he fell, I mean, Mazepa fell together with his Western ally, with his Western patron, uh, that is uh, King Charles uh, XII. Battle of Poltava, 1709, was the decisive battle that uh, paved the way for Russian control, Russian imperial control over Eastern Europe. After beating Poland in late 17th century, Sweden in the early 18th century, Russian Empire had an open way to uh, both to occupy in the near future Finland, uh, to occupy all Baltic uh, uh, territories, I mean contemporary Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania, occupy Poland finally and also began uh, to, to start expansion towards the Danube, towards, uh, towards uh, the Balkans against Turkey. So uh, that uh, uh, particular uh, expansion towards the uh, south, towards the Black Sea, led to realization of the concept known as Novorossiya. And here is exactly the map of Novorossiya as they developed in predominantly uh, second half of 18th century with uh, the following stages of Russian expansion against Turkey, first against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, then against Turkey. And this particular story of Russian uh, occupation of these territories uh, serves now very effectively in Putin's ideology as a tool uh, justifying, according to his propaganda, uh, expansion against Ukraine. Putin says, we stormed these territories by our military forces, Russian military forces, and that's why it should belong to us, to, uh, to Russia, not to Ukraine, uh, which, uh, which uh, had these territories earlier, before. Uh, that uh, expansion towards uh, the south led Russia finally towards the gates of the city that represents the symbolical core of the neo-Byzantine, uh, so to speak, tradition, tradition of Moscow, the third Rome. Moscow, the third Rome, comes back to the second Rome, that is to Constantinople, to Stambul. Catherine II uh, led offensive, strategic offensive, that had at its aims Constantinople. Here you can see the moment of the late uh, period of uh, long reign of Catherine II in English caricature, where uh, Devil offers Catherine Warsaw and Constantinople. Catherine, uh, Catherine preferred Warsaw. 
actually. Uh, so uh, she took uh, by force um, and uh, liquidated uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, she didn't manage to take Constantinople uh, first and foremost because the Brits didn't want. Atlantic evil forces stopped Russia from taking back to Eastern Orthodox Empire its symbolical center that is Byzantine um, capital, Constantinople. Uh, that uh, particular uh, clash of Russian imperial interest with British imperial interest, because it was clash of imperial interests over strategically important gate to Asia, uh, began so-called great game throughout the 19th century, the great game that concentrated in Asia rather than in Europe. From the point of view of Western uh, empires, especially England, what happened in Ukraine, what happened in Poland, didn't matter at all. What was important from the British imperial, uh, so to speak, perspective was concerning Turkey, Central Asia, uh, Afghanistan, these were the clashing points of two imperialisms in the 19th century. Uh, Eastern Europe was treated as a natural backyard of Russian Empire by Western empires, or as a backyard of Austro-Hungarian Empire, that is Germanic Empire, or finally the Second Reich united by Bismarck in uh, the uh, 1870 uh, war. Uh, that particular, maybe I will make it bigger, that particular 19th century experience was somehow uh, intensified with the ideological clash between Russian imperial conservative idea and revolution in Europe, already from the French Revolution. But it was even strengthened the moment when Karl Marx coined his own, so to speak, ideology, linking in his political text, not in his most important ideological pronunciations, but in his political uh, articles for American journals, for example, during the so-called Crimean War, Marx expressed his, I would say, typically German point of view on Russia, that Russia uh, is uh, simply a kind of Mongolic uh, Asiatic empire that is dangerous to Germans, to Europe, and that's why uh, Russia should be pushed back from Europe. That uh, particular, uh, so to speak, perspective, sorry, uh, together with uh, experiences of yet another clash with Europe over Constantinople, that is Crimean War from mid-19th century, led to the uh, very, I would say, important outbreak of a series of ideological concepts presented by Russian writers, ideologues, exactly after the Crimean War to, so to speak, understand the clash with the West. The most, the most important among uh, these, uh, so to speak, voices against the West after Crimean War belong to Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, whom you see here. He is not only author of uh, Biese, which were mentioned in, in one of the titles of uh, my books, um, uh, and many other uh, wonderful uh, novels. Uh, but he is also, he was also a very prolific uh, political journalist. In his uh, diary of a writer, uh, which was one of the most uh, popular columns in political press of Russia in uh, the 70s of the 19th century, he presented his vision of solving the problem with the West from the Russian imperial point of view. Uh, Dostoevsky had two different, uh, uh, so to speak, solutions of that problem. He first stated, the West hates us. We have to acknowledge this. this. We are against the West. Dostoevsky 
followed the footsteps of the idea of Moscow the Third Rome. Eastern Orthodoxy was the core element of this identity which uh, Dostoevsky accepted. But he added, added to, to that some, I would say, geopolitical combinations. So, uh, in 1877, he expressed his deepest sympathy towards Germany. We should ally with Germany. Why? Because Germany represents Protestant tradition, which is less evil than Catholic, than Latin. And Germany is natural enemy of France and Great Britain, according to geopolitics from, uh, from that time, that is the uh, second half of the uh, 19th century. And by destroying unity of the West, we enhance our, that is Russian, chances to win this vital war against the West. The war we just lost in the Crimean, uh, so to speak, war of um, the mid 19th century. So we need to divide the West. Germany is the best, so to speak, um, uh, possible partner in this division of the West. We divided already together with Germany, Poland, that was, uh, that was uh, very effective and very helpful for both of us, for Prussia and for Russia. And uh, so now we have to finish with France, with, uh, so, the, so to speak, this Atlantic fringe of Europe. This is something that Germans should do and we will take the rest. We should divide the world between Germany and Russia. That is what states Dostoevsky openly in January 1877. Western Europe for Germany, Asia uh, and Eastern Europe for us. But very soon, in the end of that same year, Dostoevsky switched his concept to the original idea, it is impossible to divide the West. Germany is as much enemy as the rest of uh, the West because Chancellor Bismarck at that particular moment decided to help rather British Prime Minister than Russia uh, in the moment, critical moment when Russian forces were at the gates of Constantinople. And Bismarck, however, very careful with his relationship with Russia, decided to convene a diplomatic uh, convention in Berlin that deprived Russia of the effects of military victory over Turkey in that particular moment. So that made Dostoevsky to think, no, all the West hates us. Germans would never be our faithful allies. Uh, it is impossible uh, for, in the longer run to construct that, uh, that union with Germany. Uh, Dostoevsky admired very much this gentleman, uh, Nikolai Danilevsky, who was his exact contemporary. Uh, born in 1821, uh, and who presented in his works, uh, political works, a kind of pseudo-scientific justification of a Russian Western hatred. The, the main book by Nicholas Danilevsky is Russia and Europe, uh, perspective on, um, uh, uh, on political cultural relations. And Danilevsky coined for the first time a concept which is known as plurality of civilizations. Danilevsky stated, the West has as its essential symbolical power the concept that there exists only one civilization, that is Western civilization, centered somewhere between Paris, London and Amsterdam. While, in fact, there is not just one civilization, there are many. And he enumerates uh, 12 such civilizations uh, from different parts of the globe. What is the role of Russia? Russia not only represents Slavic civilization, pan-Slavic idea of uniting all Slavs, Czechs, for example, pan-Slavism was popular among Czechs at that time. Uh, unlike in Poland, uh, due to obvious reasons, Poland being occupied by Russia didn't like, uh, so to speak, this kind of occupation. Uh, while other Slavs being dominated by other powers such as Germans or uh, Turks uh, long for liberation from Russia. So 
that was only a part of Danilevsky idea that Russia should form something like a pan-Slavic empire comprising all territories that would form outer Soviet empire in mid 20th century. The lines that drew Danilevsky for that Russian Slavic empire were exactly the lines from the Trieste to Stettin. It was for the first time used not by Churchill in his Fulton speech, but by Danilevsky in his book in 1871. Uh, but this is only a part, the, the main, uh, so to speak, idea of Danilevsky, and much more interesting, much more original, is to say that Russia should lead the rebellion of all the world, of all other civilizations against the West. Russia always liberates. Russia only liberates other, uh, other nations, other weaker uh, partners from some yoke. So this most, ambition, uh, most ambitious uh, goal for Russia is to liberate the world, Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America, from Western dominance, from Western imperial dominance. And I am stating that idea because it shows exactly uh, one important combination in which contemporary ideology of Russian aggression is justified. We fight, we Russia, fight only against American imperialism, uh, American or Western imperialism in which we represent not just Russia, but also people of Africa, people of, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, Asia, uh, uh, Latin America. And that's why uh, we can see how successful Russian propaganda is in these countries. Uh, the reality is that, well, maybe majority of the West is against Russia in this particular aggression against Ukraine. But majority of Africa, of Asia and of Latin America, almost all Latin America, is for Russia, against Ukraine. That's sad, true. Uh, due to, to a very, I would say, effective propaganda investment for that propaganda on Russian side, not only here in Poland, Czechia, uh, Germany, France, but first and foremost in Africa, Asia uh, and uh, Latin America. Contemporary of uh, Danilevsky was Konstantin Leontiev, uh, uh, whose main book I present here, Byzantinism and Slavdom. He uh, criticized uh, Danilevsky uh, for one thing, for forgetting Byzantine civilization as a separate civilization. And he stated that Russia should follow the steps of Byzantine Empire and to stop from any contacts with the West, to withdraw to Asia. So with that idea, Leontiev became uh, the forefather of the Eurasianist movement. He was the first to present this concept that Russia should stop any relations with Europe and to develop its Asiatic element. Because from Europe comes only rottening tendencies, moral corruption, and destruction of Russian identity. So Russia should uh, go for help in Asia. The men who presented these ideas in the most succinct way in Russian culture, along with Pushkin, by the way, I, we don't have time to listen to Pushkin's uh, main poem on that subject, uh, to the calumniators of Russia, but I want that you listen for, uh, I don't know uh, how much time I have, maybe something like 20 minutes uh, or 15 minutes. Uh, so I would suggest that we listen for five minutes to the poem of Alexander Bloch. Do you know Scythians by Alexander Bloch? How many of you have heard that poem? So it's worth listening, even if uh, several of uh, you uh, have listened to that. Alexander Bloch was the greatest Russian poem a poet from the so-called Silver Age, that is the beginning of the 20th century symbolist, uh, who wrote that poem on January 1918, just after the coup the Bolshevik made in Petrograd. Uh, and he expressed in that idea, uh, the Scythians, identification of Russia with the Scythians, the Asiatic barbaric element that is valued positively as opposed to the corrupted Europe. 
And this relationship between Russia and Europe is presented as a typical, I would say, has Liebe uh, example. Hatred and love at the same time. And how it is presented, it is better that you rather listen to the poet than to myself. Oh, I hope it will work. Не сдвинемся, 
когда свирепый гум в карманах трупа будет шарить, Жечь города и в церковь гнать табун, И мясо белых братьев жарить. Последний раз опомнить старый На братский пир труда и мира. Последний раз на светлый братский пир Взывает варварская лира. Okay. This was exactly the moment when uh, Bok wrote that poem, the moment when Bolsheviks took power and Bok decided to serve the Bolsheviks until the moment he uh, actually stopped living uh, under uh, the uh, Bolshevik regime, uh, unable to create uh, freely uh, his poems. Uh, but that particular moment that could be seen as a critical point in that relationship between Russia and Europe, European-made ideology came to Russia. And in turn, Russia once again into anti-Western power. That was a kind of paradox that Russia, representing now revolution, once again was only in the world against the rest of the world, uh, fighting with all uh, neighbors in the name of the great revolution, liberating again using that term. We liberate our neighbors in the name of Marx now, in the name of the Marx who despised us Russians. That's why, by the way, that Stalin in 1934 decided in a secret um, uh, session of Politburo to castigate Marx as being guilty of uh, anti-Russian uh, tendencies. But officially, Russia, uh, Soviet Russia, was realizing Marxist tenets united with Russian imperialism. And that particular concept here uh, under Lenin, uh, again, a global, Russia regained its global mission. Now Russia was the third international, not the third Rome, but representing yet one more global universal um, ideology with the center in Moscow. However, the real founder of that mixture of communist ideology with Russian imperialism was Yosef Stalin. He presented that idea at a very early stage. Uh, this is something which I uh, think uh, was overlooked by most of uh, the analysts uh, of that idea. The moment when in 1920, after being beaten on the front of uh, Russian offensive against Poland, against the West, when Russian Bolshevik storm of the West failed at the gates of Warsaw in 1920, Stalin went to, uh, to lead a further offensive against Georgia and uh, Azerbaijan, more generally speaking, against Asia. And he stated that it is on Asia and, or all and on all oppressed people from non-European regions taken uh, by and exploited by uh, imperial centers of Europe, Russia, communist Russia, should base its geopolitical strength. His words uttered at that moment in Vladikaukas in November 1920 are worth um, uh, quoting. Here I stand on the borderline between the old capitalist world and the new socialist world. Here on this borderline, I unite the efforts of the proletarians of the West and of the peasants of the East in order to shatter the old world. May the God of history be my aid. Very solemn, so to speak, oath using once again this opposition, the West and the rest. Russia represent the rest, once again. Uh, actually, in, in these speeches, I am tempted to quote them because they seem to me very important. He also mentioned something very important that reverberates in Putin's ideological presentations of the meaning of contemporary crisis. 
Namely, Putin on many occasions stresses that at the root of the problem of nowadays is Versailles Treaty. Versailles Treaty, the moment when Russia was a loser and Germany were uh, losing, so to speak, to Atlantic powers. And that's why Russia and Germany had to shatter this Versailles yoke and to eliminate, as Putin used this word, randomly created states. And he didn't mean only Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, but the most randomly created state was Czechoslovakia, of course, in the Versailles Treaty. So going on and on to the Versailles Treaty as the source of all problems for the 20th and 21st century, Putin simply states that there is no place for small countries. There is only place for big empires. And once again, he tries to use this concept of Russian, German uh, rapprochement based on this imperial collaboration. And um, Stalin used this term exactly in his speeches from the 1920 from uh, Georgia when he stated that these small countries uh, that were created at, uh, on the place of Austria-Hungary uh, are simply uh, uh, put at the moment of vital choice, either to be with Russia, with the progress, with liberation that Bolshevik Russia represents, or to be with the West, which would doom them, that is, these countries, uh, uh, for being uh, united with the old world that will be distracted, just uh, following the lines of bloc. So that particular idea was realized by Stalin, as you know, in uh, 1945, after World War I, when he created the dream of Danilevsky, that is pan-Slavic union with some non-Slavic elements added due to geopolitical realities, I mean, Hungarians or, and Romanians. And here, this uh, modest man is someone whom you might saw on the streets of Prague some, uh, well, uh, 80, 90 years back. He was Piotr Nikolaevich Savitsky, the real founder of Eurasianism, the, the ideology that was created in its full version in 1920 in Sofia, Bulgaria, and moved its center to Prague together with a group of prominent intellectuals, Russian emigre intellectuals, that developed this original embryo of the idea stemming from Leontiev and Danilevsky, that is, they united Leontiev and Danilevsky, Eurasianists, uh, Savitsky among them, in the concept that Russia represents all these trampled non-European civilizations and should lead them to re take revenge against the West. But Russia needs to be powerful in order to make this revenge effective. That was the idea of Savitsky. Well, Savitsky himself would feel that might of Russia when, who, when he will be taken uh, to uh, one of Gulag camps when Russia took control over Czechoslovakia after World War II. Um, so here I wanted only to show this gentleman as intermediary leading stride to Alexander uh, Dugin, Alexander Helievich Dugin the contemporary exponent of the idea of Eurasianism. There is no need probably to uh, develop on Dugin due to the simple fact that he became something like an icon of that idea in the last uh, months especially. Uh, towards the end, I want to present the concept of Eurasianism as it is developed not only by Dugin, but also by several other ideologues of that tendency. That uh, concept is based on a geopolitical model created by English geopolitician Halford Mackinder in the beginning of 20th century and changed to the, so to speak, needs of Russian imperialism. Russia represents the uh, center of land power, heartland, which is circulated, uh, encircled, sorry, uh, encircled by uh, sea powers, uh, that is, the states, the United States and England. So Russia fights to broaden that land power base with China, 
India and uh, a large part of Europe. However, in more detailed concept of Dugin, uh, there are important geopolitical nuances. Dugin do not want Russia to be united with China. Due to a simple reasoning, China would be stronger in, in some not very distant future. Actually, she already is stronger than Russia. So that's why Russia, in order not to be dominated in China, should find other partners, India and among Islamic powers, not Turkey, because with Turkey, Russia had, uh, has a natural conflict over domination uh, over uh, Turkic people inhabiting uh, Central Asia. Erdogan is a not natural partner of Putin, quite the contrary. In the longer run, he is a rival. That's why Russia should unite with Shia Islamic powers, with Tehran, with Persia. Uh, as regards Europe, uh, the idea that is presented by Dugin, and in some elements uh, it reverberates in Putin's speeches, this is always this oscillation. Whether we can unite with Germany, a common front against America, or Germany is yet one more element of this Western enemy we should eliminate, finally. So this could be... Uh, so here is uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin uh, going uh, uh, out uh, from the building uh, raised in so-called Patriotic Park in Moscow. This is interesting because it unites traditions of the Soviet Union with Russian imperial tradition. Very quickly, one possibility for Russia being representative of this Asiatic revenge over the West. Oh, sorry. No. Oh. So maybe I will stop at that point. I don't want to torture you with contemporary Russian propaganda. Uh, only if you will, you may listen to the uh, song of young schoolboys in Russia uh, hailing Putin and describing the boundaries of the future Russia. But uh, to sum up, uh, I just put very briefly uh, in a very, I would say, chaotic way Usually I uh, consecrate something like uh, 20 to 30 hours for that subject. Uh, so sorry for this uh, chaos and uh, uh, my being hasty. Nevertheless, uh, I tried to portray the most important elements creating in Russian, uh, not just Putin's, but Russian's uh, identity, a powerful uh, motive for not accepting uh, only Ukraine as a, so to speak, uh, as a prey of its imperialism that would satisfy Russian ambitions. No, Russian ambitions go much broader and actually have a global scope in which the West is finally always the enemy. Uh, if there are uh, questions or critical commentaries, I would love to uh, discuss. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I hope that I didn't bore you to death and I hope that the discussion will be uh, more vibrant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Novak, for your very interesting and expressive presentation on uh, the tradition of the, the uh, Russian imperialism. And now it's, it's time for your questions. It's just Prashatasky in English, Chesky, Popolsky. Prosím, prosím. Uh, ještě se zeptám pana Stipora, jak s mikrofony, protože nahráváme to, tak aby to bylo dobře slyšet. Možná bych i poprosil, uh, když to budete ptát, aspoň říct své jméno a pan instituci. Uh, 
here, the gentleman here. Okay, thank you. Dzień dobry, dziękuję bardzo za panu profesorze, panu Holiczek z Asociacji dla Stosunków Międzynarodowych. I would switch to English because I can see that the majority is rather comfortable with English. As a proud alumni of the Golden University, it's my great pleasure to, to have you here with us actually today. Uh, I have a question related to your presentation because it was, uh, it was certainly a pity that you didn't have more time jumping from the old uh, time traditions all the way to Mr. Dugin was quite a jump for all of us. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I just wanted to actually uh, go back to some of these uh, um, interesting uh, pieces that you spoke about, the, uh, the Russian mentality and imperialism, and actually challenge you on one thing, because we heard uh, very little about uh, the other intellectual tradition that was not associated with um, uh, the, the tradition here in the West, but rather imitating, copying, and uh, uh, somewhat, sometimes even uh, admiring the West, you know. Uh, we can go back to 19th century, Zapanitsi and uh, their eternal struggles with Slavianophilia and so on. So, but this, this is just one example that is going through all the way the Russian history and the split soul, as I see it. So, maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about this and how do you intellectually, in your work, deal with the other Russia, the other uh, perspective on the West, you know, which has not always been the alien one, uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, enemy one and, and uh, some uh, uh, a tradition that would uh, like to destroy the West or always compete with it. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, very important question. Um, uh, I take it as an occasion to to add something to to that uh, short presentation. Actually, the beginning of this uh, pro-Western turn are also uh, historically very distant. This is the moment of Ivan the Terrible and uh, Andrei Kurbski, his friend, who fled to Poland, uh, being afraid of uh, being uh, killed by Ivan the Terrible after losing the battle against Polish-Lithuanian forces in uh, late 16th century. And Andrei Kurbski was the first political emigre of Russia. Uh, uh, he didn't want to collaborate with Poland and Lithuania at all, but he wanted exactly to find idea for Russia that would be based on imperial idea already existing in the West. And he was the one who created the name Sviatoruskaya Imperia. He was the first man who combined Russia with empire. The, the first uh, construction that used empire as a term for Russia, Holy Russian Empire. Uh, he wanted to emulate, not collaborating with Poland, but to emulate the example of Habsburg Empire, of uh, Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, as it was called. So he wanted to copy that for Russia, uh, adding some elements of, I would say, freedom for the elite in Russia that didn't exist under Ivan the Terrible. And I am starting my answer with that distant uh, example because it seems to me very revealing. He wanted to have some elements of Western freedoms, but only to strengthen Russian empire at the same time. He was no less imperialist than Ivan the Terrible. He just wanted that empire to be, well, this is anachronistic term, more liberal. Imperial, as much imperial, but more liberal. And this phenomenon of Russian liberal imperialist is a very important element of Russian tradition. It was, to a degree, strengthened and made a real phenomenon by Peter I, who understood that in order to modernize Russian army, one needs to import also from the West some institutions, some education that forms the strata, social group, that understands better the West and with that can also accept some Western ideas. Among these ideas, freedom was not that welcome, but still uh, element accepted somehow as, uh, as a dangerous gift from the West necessary to be swallowed and somehow assimilated 
with this effort to strengthen the empire, to win further battles with, uh, with uh, uh, so to speak, neighbors, immediate neighbors, Swedes, Poles, Turks. Uh, this somehow operated effectively until revolution came in the West, I mean French Revolution, and those more enthusiastic about emulating the West had to make the fight fatal choice. Either we are with revolutionary West that is against all Russian traditions, monarchical, religious, and so on and so forth, or we are uh, still more Russian. That was something that Pushkin actually who is some time absolutely mistakenly taken as a representative of that liberal Russia. Pushkin was no liberal at all in the sense of giving liberty to anyone else than Russians. He wanted to eliminate absolutely any liberty for Asiatic people taken by Russia by sword. This is his famous poem, uh, Kafkaski Plennik the most imperialistic poem in the Orientalist vein published in Russian language. And also he expressed his extremely chauvinistic feelings against Poles fighting for the independence in a series of his poems written during 1831. So whenever you see Evgeny Onegin beautiful poem by Pushkin presenting laugh, uh, so to speak, experiences of uh, a gentleman from Petersburg, uh, you should not forget that the final word of Pushkin is uh, his probably greatest poem, Miedny Vsadnik, that is Bronze Horseman, presenting exactly this conflict between liberal idea of individuality and imperial idea represented by Peter Monument. Peter triumphs. Peter is the victor in that uh, in that final word of Pushkin. Uh, of course, there were liberals such as Alexander Herzen, who decided finally, towards the end of his life, only in the last days of his activity in the emigration, Herzen understood that you cannot be imperialist and be free. And that's why Herzen was actually the first one to state that it is better to be free than to have empire. And he lost all, I would say, uh, appeal he had previously in Russian public opinion exactly due to that choice. Because, well, this was time of so-called Polish uprising, January uprising, and Herzen, by backing that uprising, compromised himself completely also among Russian left-wing uh, public opinion. Uh, so I mentioned several examples uh, of uh, representing that dilemma that if you want to be free, you have to resign from empire. Still, the most popular choice of that dilemma, and this choice is only, I would say, uh, uh, a kind of a pretense of a real choice, is that there are liberals in Russia that still believe we can be free, and we still can keep everything that Russia conquered that may be something more we, we should have. The leader of liberals of Russia in the beginning of the 20th century was Pavel Milyukov, the leader of so-called Cadet Party, Constitutional Democratic Party, fighting against autocracy. But he was the most important proponent of the idea of Russian further expansion, especially of taking Constantinople. That actually costed Russia tragedy of the Bolshevik Revolution, because even in 1970, Milukov didn't want to stop Russia from further fight in World War I that would lead to occupation of Constantinople for Russia. And of course, that paved the way for the triumph of the Bolshevik uh, force. So Milukov is a typical representative of Russian liberal imperialist. And to stop my too long once again, uh, uh, answer, uh, I will jump to the contemporary times. If you look at Alexei Navalny, he is more imperialist than Putin because he is not constrained by real politics. So he can applaud taking Crimea, he can accept reuniting, as Putin uh, calls it, 
Russian lands by the Russian army, and at the same time criticize Putin for being corrupted, for being autocratic. He wants more freedom for Russians, but no freedom for Ukrainians at all. And probably the most shocking example is Joseph Brodsky, or Josef Brodsky, if you will, uh, probably the greatest Russian poet of the second half of the 20th century, which is epitome of freedom, of liberalism, fighting against uh, extreme autocracy or even totalitarian regime of the communist Russia. And at the moment Ukraine gained independence, he wrote such an incredibly hateful poem against Ukrainians that one really needs to go to, the, to a psychiatric specialist in order to understand that outburst of hatred against Ukrainians. Why? Such a man who, who consecrated a large part of his life for freedom of Russians cannot stand the, the idea that Ukrainians want to be free. So this is the dilemma among Russian liberals. And there are very few of them that follow Herzen. Uh, maybe now it's Garry Kasparov to a degree that says Russia should break apart in order to be free, in order to allow its inhabitants to be free, because we cannot keep empire and gain freedom. Thank you. Next question. Master Papestia. Yeah, I'm Polish, but maybe I will just follow the tradition and just say some my question uh, in English. Um, I'm not like linked to any university currently. I'm just working here for some American corporation, but I know Krakow. I studied at European Institute in, in Jagiellonka. But my question is rather uh, related to another country because we heard a lot about this ambiguous. Um, um, uh, position of Russia versus Germany, like in some period it was treated as an ally or enemy, depending on the, on the, consist on, you know, the, on the situation. But um, I would like to ask you about another country, about France. We know that France is well known for this admiration for Russia mm -hmm. as a culture, and currently puts up even a lot of talks of President Macron with, with, with uh, President Putin. And, but what was approach of Russia towards um, towards uh, France? It was like as well seen as an enemy or an ally. Or, or this is my question. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there are uh, two uh, perspective, uh, per perspectives on that question. One historical, when France was identified uh, by some part of uh, Russian, uh, uh, so to speak, intellectuals or ideologues as one of the key elements of Catholic Europe. Catholicism being interpreted as the arch enemy of Eastern Orthodox Russia in 19th century and pre-19th century period. That's exactly the position of Dostoevsky. That's why he hated France. Uh, but uh, as a representative of Catholicism, even though France was not that arch-Catholic at that time, yet uh, somehow historically he identified France with Catholicism and with Poland. Uh, but uh, at the same time, the fact that so many Russians since uh, 18th century, especially during the 19th century and early 20th century, traveled to France, uh, and were fascinated with French culture and vice versa. From the moment when the Russian army occupied Paris in 1940 and had for uh, three years, one has to remind, occupational zone in Normandy. Normandy was an occupational zone of Russian army between 1850 and 1870. Uh, Russians were seen with a mixture of fear and fascination by the French. Uh, the word bistro, of course, is an uh, 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 example of that uh, fascination. Uh, so that would lead to a mutual, I would say, uh, fascination uh, that is still very visible among French uh, educated class 
full of admiration to Russian culture, uh, especially late 19th century ballet uh, and uh, literature, and seeing through that prism Russian politics. Uh, however, uh, from a geopolitical point of view, France is important to uh, Russian geopoliticians of today as a partner of Germany in common effort to liberate Europe from the yoke of Americanism. So this Franco-German axis, as long as it goes out of NATO or to distance from American leadership, not just against Russia, but also against China, is something on which Putin builds its political hopes. He always addresses that issue whenever he talks to French public opinion, to French politicians or to, Amer to German. The same motive. You should liberate yourself from American patron. Uh, in both countries, I mean Germany and in France, it, it is an issue uh, for many French intellectuals. Uh, they were saved twice by Americans and no one uh, is uh, more, uh, so to speak, uh, with mixed feelings towards his savior than the saved one. And they deprived victory uh, in two world wars uh, Germany. That's why Germans also have these mixed feelings about America. And it's, it is exactly on that concept of separating continental Europe, Franco-German Europe, from America that Putin builds uh, his concept of uh, some tactical collaboration with them, based also on a concept of inter-imperial um, deal, zones of influences. For you, that is for Germany and for France, control of Europe. For me, control of Eastern Europe. That is quid pro quo. Uh, you should understand you have your own imperial tradition, so you should understand our Russian imperial tradition. Smaller nations have no, no say. You should understand you have your Africa, for example, you French, so you know what is imperialism about. Uh, that's, uh, I think, the idea that uh, still predominates and reverberates in Putin's official presentation of his uh, uh, attitude towards France. But it is interesting to listen also to semi-official voices from Russia, like Alexander Prohanov, the leader of the important arch-conservative Izborsk group. The moment Russia attacked Ukraine, uh, February 24th, he gave a very extensive interview uh, to the Russian press when he expressed the idea, yes, that's obvious that we should retake Ukraine, but we should also retake Paris. Paris is ours. Wherever there are graves of uh, Russian military, of Russian soldiers, this territory should belong to Russia. And we were there in 1814, in 1815. So this is Russian land. And of course, it can sound completely absurd, uh, idiotic idea. Nevertheless, it reverberates among some group of Russian audience. Yes, Alaska is ours, Warsaw is ours, Prague is ours, but why not? Paris is also ours. We were there. So, Professor Nolan, I have a question to uh, our Ukrainian colleagues, philosophers and historians, uh -huh. uh, talk about Russia as the last colonial empire. Mm -hmm. So, um, they reflect the defense uh, of Ukraine as a war uh, of decolonization. So, how do you rate this inter interpretation of this intellectual discourse, please? As far as I know, there is a discussion also among Ukrainian historians about, uh, or intellectuals, about that uh, issue. Uh, as it happened, I... Uh, uh, I'm proud to be uh, in close, uh, so to speak, contact with uh, the Nestor of Ukrainian historiography, American Ukrainian historiography, Roman Sporluk, who is rather critical of that position, represented by other Ukrainian historians. Uh, so, uh, I, sorry, but I don't treat Vladimir Vyatrovich as a historian uh, at all. Um, uh, 
there are many other very uh, serious historians among Ukrainians, like, for example, Andriy Portnov uh, or uh, Yaroslav Hrycak and so many other different, very different in their views. But they are serious historians. He is simply an ideologue. Um, so there is simply a discussion, a debate over that issue. And you can quote arguments on both sides. And I am in no position to, so to speak, to, to decide the discussion that is uh, taking place among Ukrainians. I see uh, strong arguments on both sides. So it's, it's a difficult question. And I'm, uh, I don't feel that I have time to, to discuss it fully. Sorry. OK, so thank you. Uh, next question. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, sorry for my English. Uh, I, am for, I am Vladimir Hankovsky, and I am from Ukraine. And I also am going about the Russian world uh, doctrine and uh, uh, what is uh, in itself a Russian world as a civil religion. So I would uh, like to ask some, some questions and uh, I give one remark. First uh, question is, uh, what would you do for this mantra in Russian myths in which the Westerners seem to believe? The Russian myths are about uh, it you have said, and um, about uh, Russian voice and Russian culture as some ideal project. So, uh, and when I was uh, sixteen in about uh, Persian, I come to an idea that the uh, Russian model of history, of uh, constructive history, is uh, like etatist, legitimist, and confessionalist model of history. So when uh, they uh, when they write uh, the history, they write the history of a state, history of the Dark Francisco. And when we are approaching to the enlightenment, now to the methodology of history, of ideas, of uh, peoples, of culture, we, we see uh, fully another different reality. So uh, we, we have, you have mentioned many points, and I would uh, like to add to it a picture. And, um, uh, Ukraine is uh, as uh, a successor of old Rus, and uh, you know it was completely different of uh, to the Russian first because it was uh, um, baptized before schism and uh, second because Lava Orthodox was not silent like as it is presented in Russian historiography. And for very humoristic uh, example, that the only poet uh, which did oppose the Russian colonial education in the past and the East was Shachenko, and, uh, and it was surprisingly Ukraine. And uh, what uh, is it the core of Western imagin imaginarium that they accepted uncritically the belief that Russia is the West, the global South? is also believing in it, and, uh, but is the case that uh, Russia is not rest but the West. But this is outdated version of the West in the 19th century. Moment. So uh, it, it is a colonial empire world where rules only the power. So the question, uh, can we consult the Central Europe uh, from the from Lava to do in the concept like the double blind spot in the global imaginarium, unseen by both the West, the East, the North, and the South, by mythological uh, aggressor in global civilization and mythological uh, global victim of the South. So we are invisible by both of these. Uh, of global mm -hmm. uh, that's a very important question. Uh, I will try to be short. Uh, so first, as regards other examples of Russian poets presenting the same, uh, even, even, even stronger words, ideas as Brodsky or uh, Pushkin or Bloch, 
uh, I consecrated a whole book to, to that, uh, which is called uh, Imperial Oaths, uh, a Metamorphosis of Russian Empire. So there are hundreds of, of the examples of that attitude in Russian great literature, because sometimes it's great literature, however serving uh, uh, imperial goals. Uh, uh, as regards uh, the, the key question, how can we react for that double blank spot? I think that on one side Putin helps us, because, uh, and I am not ironic in that, the fact that he drops bombs and kills evidently innocent people. You cannot say that these uh, women, uh, these children uh, are guilty of anything. Uh, you can, of course, construct a very, I would say, uh, acrobatic idea that this is all fault of America. But still there are Russian bombs, Russian tanks, Russian rockets and Russian soldiers that, that send these bombs to Ukrainian cities and villages. So this makes impression, even on those people in the West that previously wrote, written, France was the worst example in that respect. Kiev, Russie. I remember uh, Russia, sorry, French television, uh, France uh, de, which portrayed a reportage from uh, Kiev, Kiev. Uh, this March, exactly with the subtitle Kiev, Russie. That's, that was exactly on French television on March, uh, this year, not some distant uh, time ago. Yet, uh, the pictures from the war achieving, I would say, average Frenchman now uh, make at least a small question. Is it the same Russia that we admire? Uh, is it this Dostoevsky so innocent, this wonderful psychologist uh, with his books he written and we read with fascination? At least this simple uh, small question marks arise uh, that never existed before. The same uh, applies to Germans. Uh, as you probably know, uh, for the first time in the last year, even before the aggression, the uh, uh, number of Germans that, uh, that turned against Russia rather than pro-Russia uh, became higher, uh, which, which is a phenomenon in itself. And it's 100%, I would say, Putin's work. So he achieved something very positive from uh, our perspective, unfortunately, on Ukrainian blood. Uh, of course, we cannot rely on Putin exclusively. We have to do what we can. Uh, so we uh, publish books. We, uh, sometimes we, uh, I'm not uh, speaking about myself, about other people, uh, uh, prepare uh, films, movies, for example, there was a wonderful French-American movie about Chechen war uh, uh, by Michel Anazavitius, uh, the man who uh, got Oscar for one uh, other of his films, that presented Russian imperialism in its worst. Uh, so there are things available which you can show to the, those enthusiasts of Russian culture that present Russia in slightly different... There are also works by Russian free people. There are such Russians as well. For example, uh, Alexander Lebedev, great writer of the new generation. Yes, I like him. Maybe you disagree, but uh, I think he is a great writer and he is not pro-Putin and he doesn't seem to be imperialist. Maybe I'm wrong. Let's hope I, uh, I am not. Um, so uh, there are possibilities to build on that uh, horror that uh, Putin created in Ukraine some deeper uh, thought uh, among uh, Western audience. And uh, of course, there is work to be done among academics. So uh, I'm trying, for example, to organize a group of students of, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean those uh, scholars that study uh, Russian imperialism, a group that would uh, prepare a multi-volume history of Russian empire seen not from the center, like Karamzin, history of Russian state, but from the uh, peripheries, occupied ter peripheries. And there are many enthusiasts uh, of that work. So I hope that we will start that work. Of course, I'm not alone. There are many other centers, probably bigger, stronger than I can organize. But 
uh, there are uh, both American, Ukrainian, Lithuanian scholars, uh, German scholars that, that want to go this way, to present alternative, uh, so to speak, way of, uh, of uh, academic history of Russian imperialism. So maybe last question? Okay. Or, two, or maybe two. Two questions. Thank you very much. This is just an association for international affairs. Um, you have mentioned many countries in Europe, like France, Germany, uh, but there is also not, on, not only Russia is the revisionist country in Europe. There is also another one, which is Hungary. Um, I have just recently read uh, uh, this uh, article by Arnold Mate in Dozeci. Uh, uh, with the eight questions to our friends from Poland, um, repeating uh, the, the worst case of the Putin's propaganda. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, two questions on you first. Uh, um, uh, how this uh, uh, Hungarian attitude towards Ukraine and Russia is ideologically um, explained in, in Russia? Um, so how they work with this growing horse? Uh, in their um, uh, propaganda. And the second question, is it the end of the Polish-Hungarian friendship, uh, the, 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 the Hungarian attitude towards Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, which we see uh, unfortunately in these days? Okay. So maybe I will uh, answer quickly and then we'll uh, take your question, okay? Uh, uh, because probably you don't want to, to ask about Hungary as well, uh, but about something else. Uh, so, uh, uh, I uh, agree completely. Hungary is uh, yet another example of revisionist state, uh, though the scope of this revisionism is different. It's smaller. It applies uh, several countries, uh, Slovakia, Western Ukraine, Romania. Uh, so, it is a problem. I don't want to denigrate this. It, but it, it is not a global problem. It is a local or regional problem that is exploited very effectively by Putin. And uh, uh, the politics taken by uh, Viktor Orban in the first months of uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine was simply hideous. Was simply, uh, I would say, uh, I don't want to, to use uh, rude words. Uh, but the fact that all Hungarian army was mobilized to stay on the border was something really shocking, because to mobilize army on the border, you, you do uh, such a thing only in case you want to go forward, not to defend your weak country. And this was exactly the, the hope of realizing the first stage of, uh, I would say, de trianonization of uh, Hungarian, uh, so to speak, boundaries. That was very sad. But after half a year, I think, uh, uh, Hungary, after being criticized not only by Brussels or America, but also by its former close friends from Poland, seems to me changing slightly that politics. How deep, how quickly, I don't know. But at this stage, there is no friendship between Warsaw and Budapest. Unfortunately, because I would be happy if friendship among all Visegrad groups country would be, would be possible, realized at the same time. It's a very acrobatic idea, but still uh, very important for all partners. So uh, my hope is that, uh, that uh, Orban would be forced to change that politics. Uh, uh, and that Polish audience would understand idiocy of backing that kind of revisionism. Because I agree, there is a weekly called Dorzeczy, which represents to a degree, uh, I would say, a perspective of a very uh, minoritarian opinion in Poland, represented by so-called Confederacja, which uh, is not anti-Russian, to say the least. Uh, and they base this position exactly on the hope of restoring some great Polish empire somehow. Taking Lviv, for example, again, uh, they are maybe 5-4% strong in their backing. Yet, there exist, and they somehow 
accept politics of uh, Orban and say we should follow the same line, we Poland, to wait for the, uh, for the final crisis of Ukraine and take what remains. Uh, so this extremely idiotic, not only morally, uh, I would say, disgusting uh, politics uh, is extremely idiotic due to the logic of that, uh, of that deal. If we can make a deal about Lviv with Russia, why Russia cannot make a deal about western half of Poland with Germany? What would stop Russia from doing that? That's my constant answer to this pseudo-realist in Poland. They exist, unfortunately. They are man very minoritarian. And they are extremely stupid, sorry. Thank you. That's now really the last question. And there was, so, yeah, two questions. Uh, good evening. My name is Alexander Savov. I am uh, studying Bachelor of History. And I would like to ask you the question regarding what you said, because uh, many people now are saying regarding the, the current crisis that one of the problems which West had with Russia is that he misunderstood Russia. And I would like to ask, because it's something which I was thinking lately, you mentioned something very important, Asian element in Russia. I heard uh, on other sources that uh, what is really engraved in Russia are two things, absolute disregard for uh, human life and other is loyalty. What I am getting at, uh, wouldn't it help us, because uh, this Asian element, if you wouldn't compare it that uh, Russian mentality, even the fact that uh, right now there is no revolution uh, at the horizon in Russia, that the Russian people seem to be either passive or supportive current war, aside from people who are obviously leaving, but they are still in majority. I would like to ask, regarding the loyalty in Russian, uh, society to the ideas or to the rule is it uh, similar to something which we could see in Japan? I know that I am uh, maybe reaching, but uh, I think that if we um, understood this element, uh, it would give us better picture that the, perhaps the Asian uh, element in Russian mentality is much more bigger than we thought. Would you say that there is uh, some fanatism in Russian society, not as big as in Japan, obviously, because uh, they never been, uh, the, the, the ruler of Russia never had the uh, god status? But if you would say that it's important and that it exists in Russia, okay, I, I will use the answer given by one of my students. Uh, she was from Mongolia. And she stated simply, there is no such a thing as Asian values or Asian attitude. Asia is far too big to be put in one, uh, so to speak, concept. Contemporary Mongols are not like Genghis Khan 800 years ago and completely unlike Japanese, for example. Uh, so stating that fact, I would say that Russia, uh, by constructing ideological concept, not some academic, realistic assessment of Asia, but ideological concept of Eurasianism wants exactly to say that we are not Europeans. We are not only Europeans. This is Russian concept. This is not some Asiatic reality. This is Russian concept of distancing themselves from Europe. That we are not just Europeans. We have Asian, that is non-European values, some imagined values. And Putin stresses that quite frequently, that just like Bloch uh, stressed in his poem, that we can laugh more strongly and we can disregard life, uh, which makes our life more valuable. Because this in the West, people are so attached to their lives, to their petty lives, uh, that they cannot feel the, the, the scent of real life, real experience, where death is necessary. Uh, so that kind of ideology is something that is reverberated throughout the Russian culture and makes a specific, yes, I agree, political culture, which is studied also by Russians. The, the, there is a study of uh, political anthropology 
uh, made by a Russian scientist who exactly differentiates these two types, European and non-European. And maybe that's more accurate because it seems to me that Europe is also too broad a category. There is a very strong tradition of freedom in Poland or among Cossacks in Ukraine, but I don't know about such a strong tradition of freedom among Germans, for example, or among uh, French people that are so attached to bureaucracy. Uh, of course, maybe I'm wrong, but I am just saying that Europe is also a very big uh, 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 category, maybe too big. So uh, that would be my, uh, once again, too long uh, answer to your uh, question. The last question, if you will. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is, my name is Jakub, I study at this university. So I would like to maybe challenge uh, the conclusions that you made. Mm -hmm. Because uh, your conclusions is that uh, Russia attacked the Ukraine because of the imperial history. Mm -hmm. So you are basing it on basically like uh, two causes. First is that you are giving the uh, imperial history in the 18 and 19 uh, uh, centuries, which uh, just half of the world was belonging to Brits and France and too many other nations. And the second is that you are basing it on the Soviet and Russian propaganda, which is uh, flexible, is changing, and also on some quotations of some random writers like Bloch or Tarkhanov. Mm -hmm. uh, Can you make really this kind of uh, conclusions based on this, when there are some insiders, maybe you are familiar with like Sergei Pugachev, mm -hmm. which was a close friend, also a senator, that gave multiple interviews that is explaining the war with maybe some deep uh, disgrace with Ukraine after the Orange Revolution with Putin and not by in imperialist uh, motivations. Uh, so sorry that I'm answering uh, through question. Uh, could you say what would be your or Pugachev answer to the question why Putin attacked Ukraine? With the deep disgrace with Ukraine itself after the Orange Revolution that they didn't want to follow him, his uh, dream, and this is why he has a deep problem only with Ukraine, not with Kazakhstan, not with other countries, post-Soviet, where there are, where there is left some Russian uh, population, but only with Ukraine itself. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I uh, absolutely disagree with that concept, due to the fact that Kazakhstan have a very serious problem with Russia, and that's why uh, Kazakhstan at this moment withdrew from backing Russia uh, against uh, uh, Ukraine due to the exact knowledge among all Kazakhstan elite that Kazakhstan is the next uh, prey of that re-imperialization, which was stated not by Putin, but by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who after coming back to Russia stated, we have to re-affirm uh, our unity with Ukraine and Belarusia and we should take half of Kazakhstan, because this is territory where Russian people live, and we should liberate them. And Putin states that openly on many occasions, that we should liberate our people, Russian people living outside, which means not just Kazakhstan, but also uh, Latvia, Estonia. This is one of many versions of Russian imperialism, the mildest version, I would say, because it attaches only a, a serious a circle of countries that belong to the Soviet Union. But if you follow the line of Pugachev, uh, I, I mean uh, Sergei Pugachev, uh, that this was just a kind of uh, psychiatric reaction of one man, of Putin, you completely misunderstand realities. How Russia, most of Russian people, back this fact that R Russia attacked Ukraine, how it is that uh, Putin's popularity rose to 90% after Putin invaded Crimea? Is it connected with uh, some psychosis uh, of uh, uh, Russian people uh, that is shared by uh, Putin exactly on the reac reaction of Ukraine against the uh, Orange Revolution? This is simply short-sighted uh, vision of uh, a man who presents his opinion, but the opinion which I presented here, of course, can be 
uh, can be attacked on the same uh, way that one man presents his own opinion based on scant uh, selection of quotations. But uh, as I assure you, I could stay here for 60 hours and give you tens of thousands uh, uh, of other quotations from a very broad uh, range of sources that confirm that phenomenon, that not just Putin, but most of Russians want Ukraine back. That's the way they think. They want them back. Thank you, thank you so much.